very much for uh, having me. Um, I'm Cole, and uh, and I want to thank the organizers for for allowing me to do this virtual presentation. I'm sorry that I'm not with you in person. This is always a great meeting, and I, I'm sorry to miss it this year. Um, today, I'll mostly be talking about technology and developmental biology, but the workflow uh, that I'm going to discuss raises some, I, I think, very exciting computational and statistical challenges and opportunities that I think will particularly interest this crowd. Um, before I tell you about that, uh, here's a, a few disclosures that I, I want to I make sure that I'm clear about um, so you can look at those. What I'm going to talk about today is my lab's work to develop new approaches for developmental genetics at whole embryo scale and single cell resolution. Um, so as many of you, I'm sure, know, a developing embryo is built from uh, a huge collection of buzzing, noisy components. And the genome encodes a program of development, embryonic development, that has to cope with randomness at varying scales. So, you know, noise in transcription leads to stochasticity in gene regulation, and that in turn makes cells' fate decisions probabilistic. And those cells are organized into tissues with, you know, with a defined anatomy, but tissues don't grow like crystals. There's variability in the composition, the cellular proportions, and in the arrangement in each organ and in, in the embryo. And, um, Fluctuating environmental conditions have to be buffered, particularly for organisms like fish that uh, develop externally. Um, and yet, despite all of this stochasticity, um, you know, early embryogenesis is just is just tremendously robust. You can remove thirty percent of the cells in a zebrafish embryo that's four hours uh, after fertilization, and it'll compensate and, and appear basically normal, phenotypically normal, at twenty six hours it'll just be a little bit smaller. Uh, and as Conrad Waddington observed in the 1950s, mutants tend to be more variable and less robust than the wild type. So, you know, how do genomes achieve this? How do genomes encode robust developmental programs? That's one of the, the main questions that my lab is interested in. And it's widely believed that uh, the strategy that genomes use to achieve this is that they're that the, their regulatory genes are organized into circuits that are full of positive and negative feedback loops, and that these circuits uh, drive cell fate decisions and generate cell types in the right uh, proportions, you know, make organs and limbs of the right size, and allow cells to self-organize into intricate patterns in a kind of a stabilized or, or robust way. And you know, figuring out how these circuits are wired and which genes are important in them is painstaking and laborious work in, in developmental genetics. And in my lab, uh, we've most recently been seeking to apply and adapt new tools in single cell genomics to map out these circuits that vertebrate genomes uh, use to encode robust developmental programs. So we're broadly interested in three questions, uh, all of which I'll discuss today. Um, the first is you know, just a basic one, which tissues and cell types develop most reproducibly across individual embryos? Uh, the second is, you know, how are key genes organized into circuits that ensure the reproducibility of that development? And, um, and finally, uh, how does the genome buffer environmental variability uh, during development? So uh, today, uh, first I'll tell you about some past efforts at kind of a high level uh, to study development and, and some tools that we've used to study development, mostly at the scale of genes and in individual cells. And then I'll spend most of the talk on ongoing work focused on uh, variability and changes across tissues and whole embryos, including how they deal with a stressful environment. And then uh, very briefly at the end, I'll touch on some of our future plans with an emphasis on sort of the computational problems that I see uh, being important in the next, uh, you know, going forward for us at least. So as, as probably everyone here knows, you know, single cell genomics technologies have matured to the point where now our field uh, has been able to construct cell atlases that define the transcriptomes of every cell type in a whole animal. And our hope for these atlases is that they'll serve as reference data sets for developmental genetics and also for other applications. And uh, single cell genomics and sequencing experiments, at least in principle, are you know, amazing for high content phenotyping because they just generate such rich and high resolution data. So let's say you know, you're comparing a wild type animal to a mutant. With single cell RNA-seq, you measure how every other gene is dysregulated in the mutant in all the different types of cells. Um, and, and you can also detect, you know, losses and gains in the proportions of the different cell types. 
and even track in the context of development how uh, a mutation might alter the kinetics of, of each cell type's development. But of course, doing single cell RNA-seq for even small perturbation experiments can be really expensive. And so today, what, mainly what I'm going to tell you about are a couple of tools that we've developed um, to make even very large experiments practical. So the first tool is just a technique, and you may have heard about this before. I've actually talked about this at, at ISMB before um, for, for doing single cell sequencing on lots and lots of cells, which is, you know, we're going to need that if we want to profile whole embryos. If we could sequence enough cells, in principle, we could measure the expression of every gene in every cell type at every stage of its development in the whole animal. And one of the challenges with single cell sequencing is just physically isolating the cells from one another before making their libraries. And you can do this in various ways. You can do this in, in tiny capillaries or in uh, droplets, but ultimately it becomes bottleneck. <clears throat> and as part of a multi-year collaboration with Jay Shanduri's lab, we have worked on a, a technique called combinatorial cellular indexing, or SkySeq for short, which allows us to, for example, sequence the transcriptomes of millions of cells in one experiment very inexpensively. And it, it achieves that because it labels the molecular content of each cell through successive rounds of splitting and pooling without ever having to physically isolate them as single cells from one another. And we've used SkyRNA-seq to, for example, for the first time, sequence uh, you know, all the cell types in an entire animal, creating a molecular uh, atlas in a single experiment. And this, this overall idea came from Jay's lab, in particular uh, in the context of single cell chromatin accessibility. Uh, Darren Kasanovich and Riza Daza uh, invented that protocol. And then later, Jun Kao uh, adapted the idea for RNA. And uh, with Bob Waterston, our labs um, sequenced all the cell types in the worm. Um, which was the first time anybody had ever, ever done sort of a whole animal in one shot. Um, and so like in the plot that I'm showing you on the right, probably everybody knows this in this room, but um, you know, each dot is a cell. Two cells are near each other when they have similar transcriptomes. And you can see that in this experiment, the cells form clusters, which for the most part correspond to different, different cell types. So how does this work? Well, you might already know this, but just so we're on the same page, uh, we first take a bunch of cells that we've dissociated from tissue or nuclei that we've extracted from tissue and we pull them together and fix and permeabilize them. And then we distribute them into the wells of a 96 well plate. And then to each well, we add reverse transcriptase along with a RT primer that has a well identifying barcode on the end of it. And um, because these cells are permeabilized, but, not, uh, but still intact, uh, the, when you run the RT reaction in this plate, the cDNA that's made stays inside the cells or nuclei. And it's because of you know, each of the RT primers has a well identifying barcode on it, the cDNAs are labeled with the identity of the well in which they were made. And so then you can pull the intact cells back out and pull them together and split them into a new plate. And this time, you know, if you want, you can uh, crack them open and turn these cDNA libraries into Illumina sequencing libraries uh, with a, a PCR reaction. And if you include a second well identifying barcode on the PCR primer, now every library fragment that you've made is labeled twice once with the well that its cell went through in the first plate and once with the well its cell ended up in, in the second plate. And so as long as you don't shove too many cells through this workflow, you can take all those cDNA, all those library fragments and sequence them together. And oops, I'm missing a slide here. And anytime you see two reads that, um, that have the same pair of well identifying barcodes, you can reasonably infer just because of you know, math and probability that they came from the same cell. So you've done single cell RNA-seq without ever having physically isolated individual cells. And over the last couple of years, Jay's lab and mine have worked together with a number of collaborators to profile gene expression and or chromatin accessibility in worms, in mice, and more recently in human fetal tissues to build cell atlases for each of these organisms using SkySeq. And over the last five years or so, the, the throughput of the protocols has dramatically improved. You know, we were doing, uh, you know, thousands of cells in the, in the worm experiment, in the human fetal atlas experiments, uh, the gene expression one was built from around 4 million cells. So orders of magnitude increases in throughput over the last couple of years. Now, what do you do with all that data? I think many people in this crowd are going to be familiar with the techniques the field has come up with. So I'm not going to cover this in detail, but just so we're all on the same page, you know, analyzing whole embryo single cell RNA-seq is hard for two main reasons. The first is that unlike in adult tissue, cells from embryos don't always segregate into distinct clusters that correspond to cell types. The cells are asynchronously differentiating and maturing 
And that gives you more like continuous smears or what I call trajectories uh, rather than clusters often. And the second is just that the data sets get huge, right? When we sequenced the mouse embryo, we were working with a matrix that has you know, 20,000 rows and a million columns. So basically a table with 20 billion entries, which is big enough that you know, without specialized data structures to deal with it, uh, the sparsity, for example, your computer is just going to you know, beg for death and, and crash. So um, you know, when I was a postdoc, I, I worked on techniques, uh, introduced techniques for dealing with the first part of that problem, you know, the fact that things are continuous and uh, use sort of machine learning and computational geometry and, uh, and uh, manifold learning and, and you know, uh, that kind of thing to reveal how you know, cells change in terms of the genes they're regulating as they make their fate decisions. And here I'm showing a trajectory for the nematode worm using data from Bob Waterston's lab. Each, again, each dot is a cell. They're colored by the age of the embryo. And what you can see is that um, they sweep out these beautiful branch structures, which correspond to the many fates being generated, many different cell fates generating in the embryo at the time. And in the past couple of years, tools like UMAP have made both the geometry part of this problem way easier and more scalable. Uh, so now we can um, do this kind of thing on huge data sets with millions of cells. Okay, so that was sort of a brief introduction of some tools that you need to know. I want to tell you about one more thing, and then we'll get to the meat of the talk. And the, the one more, the, the additional tool is, is how you sequence single cells from lots of samples. And, you know, it might not be clear why you'd want to do this, but if we want to study the genetic basis of reproducibility in development, it's not enough to compare, you know, one mutant embryo to one that's wild type. We need to look at lots of embryos if we want to look at reproducibility. And um, if we're reading out the effects of whatever we've done to the, you know, to the embryo, knocked out a gene or whatever it is, with single cell RNA-seq, we basically have to make a little cell atlas out of each one of those embryos. And if we're starting to look at multiple genes or lots of different perturbations that, you know, genes that might work together in a circuit, for example, this really starts to add up. So uh, how can we do single cell RNA-seq on lots of different embryos at once? Um, several groups have introduced what are called hashing techniques, where you basically label the cells uh, from each sample with a barcoded DNA oligo that kind of ends up in each cell's library and tells you what sample it came from. And you can do this in a variety of different ways, you know, functionalizing the oligos with chemical modifications or sticking them on antibodies or, or what, what have you. And we realized that because our sky rna seq technique works with permeabilized fixed cells or nuclei, we don't actually need to modify the oligos at all. Uh, when we incubate short DNA oligos, single-stranded oligos with permeabilized cells, they just stick non-specifically to nuclear proteins and get trapped in the nuclei, and they can be fixed in place. So we can label our cells with vanilla oligos, just like you'd order from you know, IDT or something for PCR, which is great because that means that they're super stable and super cheap. So we've used this labeling trick in a couple of different ways. Um, we first used it for multiplexing. Sanjay Srivatsan, uh, together with Jose McFallon, along with Vijay Ramani, who invented this technique uh, called Skyplex, um, first use Skyplex to interrogate the dose-dependent effects of each of 188 different drugs on three different cancer cell lines. And uh, this experiment amounted to performing single-cell RNA-seq on more than 4,000 specimens at once. And in that study, we focused on how individual cancer cells can respond very differently to exactly the same dose of a given drug. Um, later, we devised a way to use oligo hashing, this, this technique of labeling uh, cells with oligos, to add spatial information to uh, sky RNA seq. And together with Kelly Stevens' lab, used it to construct uh, single cell spatial maps of, of expression in, uh, in mouse embryos. And then in work that really just appeared, I, I guess, a month or two ago, we've been using hashes to uh, create ladders for normalizing data, which dramatically improves the accuracy of our transcript quantification and enables us to better study transcriptional variability across individual cells. So uh, in work that I'm going to show you today, uh, we've been using uh, this sort of Skyplex multiplexing workflow to sequence lots of individual embryos. And the way it works is we first deposit a single embryo into each well of a plate, and then we dissociate each embryo to create uh, a suspension from that embryo. And then we label those suspensions, uh, those cells, using, using oligos. Um, they adhere and, and become trapped in the cells, and we can fix them in place. So then we can pool the cells from all the embryos together and se sequence them with sky RNA seq And from that experiment, we'll get not only the genes that each cell or nucleus is expressing, but the oligo that tells us what embryo it came from, 
so we can count up how many cells of each type there are in each embryo, and we compare those cell type counts across time or, or perturbations. Okay. So we wanted to use this, this idea, this workflow, to, uh, to do single cell sequencing uh, to map genes that control the variability of every cell type in the embryo. And we needed a model organism uh, in which we could easily analyze hundreds or even thousands of individual embryos with single cell sequencing. Um, and it turned out that basically the zebrafish is ideal for our purposes because it develops quickly, we can easily manipulate the genome, and a single researcher can sequence each of uh, hundreds of uh, mutant embryos in a day. So we've launched, you know, in my lab, uh, what is for us at least a major effort to analyze the zebrafish via massively multiplexed whole embryo developmental genetics at single cell resolution. Um, and to study how genetic or environmental perturbations affect the zebrafish uh, embryo's development, we first needed kind of a reference data set that just maps out all the molecular states that cells can go through during normal embryogenesis. And there have been a few atlases for zebrafish, but they aren't uh, resolved at the level of individual embryos, so they can't really tell you much about uh, how perturbations might impact reproducibility. So we made a new atlas. And uh, to do that, we sequenced nuclei from over a million cells uh, from uh, uh, more than 1,200 different embryos, individual embryos, spanning 18 hours to 96 hours uh, post-fertilization. And this is a window in development when the organs are forming. Uh, it, it sort of opens in the middle of uh, segmentation and, and uh, somatogenesis and extends all the way through uh, organogenesis and, in, and even into the early uh, larval stage of development. So, um, you know, based on looking at, at gene markers, we can tell what tissues these cells uh, come from. We know that they come from uh, one of 33 major tissues and belong to uh, one of 85 major cell types. And, you know, we can break up these cell types into subtypes at much finer resolution. Um, so that's kind of the, the reference atlas that we have here. But what I really want to tell you about is how we're uh, using this, this data set and, and additional experiments to understand uh, perturbations. So I'm going to start with uh, experiments aimed at understanding how uh, the, the genome buffers or fails to buffer stress from the environment. And one of the you know, very common challenges that organisms that develop externally face, uh, like fish that develop in the water, is temperature stress. Um, it's kind of a nice advantage, actually, of zebrafish as a model for embryonic development because you can, because you know, since they develop externally, you can perturb their development through the environment in a straightforward way. So, you know, for example, if you raise zebrafish at the kind of standard or reference temperature of 28 degrees, they come out like this. They look straight as an arrow. But if you dial up the temperature even just a few degrees, and this is still, you know, well within the range that they encounter as tropical fish in their natural habitat, with some frequency, not every fish, but some proportion of them, you start to see bends in their tails and other, you know, if you look close, you can see other kind of weird things that happen with their anatomy. And we wanted to understand the molecular basis of these phenotypes. So we sequenced, uh, in a new experiment, we sequenced uh, just under three quarters of a million cells from almost 300 more embryos raised at either the standard temperature or uh, one of two elevated temperatures. And then projecting these these cells onto that time series UMAP I showed you before revealed that, you know, even though at higher temperatures, we're still getting, you know, all the same cell types and, and, and getting broad capture and coverage of the embryo. And one thing that I want to point out for uh, the heat shock enthusiasts amongst you is that, you know, these temperatures are, are, they fall short of what's needed to induce a heat shock response. So we, you know, we looked hard and we didn't see any evidence that translation or RNA transcription was being broadly shut down across the genome, which is what you'd expect with a, with a conventional kind of heat shock response. This is below, below what's needed for that. In addition to introducing anatomic abnormalities, uh, hot water or warm water also makes the embryo develop more quickly. And this is like a super well-documented phenomenon it happens in flies too and other things that develop externally. Um, and for example, you know, at, at 28 degrees, an embryo will look like the one on the left 24 hours after fertilization. But at 34 degrees, the embryo reaches that stage six hours faster, which as a fraction of its life is a lot. Um, and we're gonna need to account for this acceleration if we're gonna study variability. So to do that, um, instead of looking at the data kind of the usual way, where you have a big matrix of genes by cells, uh, what we're gonna do is count up how many cells of each type there are in each embryo and put those counts into a new matrix. So now we have a matrix where the rows are cell types and the columns are embryos. 
And we're going to treat these data, this matrix, just like we would single cell RNA-seq data. We're going to make a plot where each dot is an embryo. This is a UMAP. Um, and, each, and, and two embryos are near one another when they have similar proportions of the various cell types that can arise during development. And what you can see when you color them by time is that they follow this nice sort of trajectory. Um, but what's cool is that if you color the embryos, not by the time they were collected, but by the temperature of the water they were raised in, embryos from hotter water are always a little bit ahead of the pack. And I'm not showing you the data, but the actual estimates of developmental acceleration we get from this, what we call pseudo staging method, agree almost perfectly from the estimates that you'd get by you know, conventionally staging each embryo under the microscope. And while this, is, this acceleration phenomenon is super well documented, the mechanisms underlying it are not well understood. And you know, for example, we know that um, differences in the rates of some really important biochemical reactions across species correlate with differences in the rates of those species' embryonic development. But whether and how temperature plays into all that is just not known. Okay, so um, and another cool thing is that uh, through this experiment, we can see that although temperature broadly accelerates embryogenesis, surprisingly, not every cell type is accelerated to the same extent. And we saw this with a new computational method we developed that measures each cell's transcriptional maturity, which revealed that some cell types accelerate way more than others, even within the same embryo. So here in this plot, each, each point is a cell type, and the y-axis denotes the uh, departure from the expected maturity, with up being more mature and down being less mature. And amongst the cell types that's most accelerated is the notochord, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Moreover, we see that temperature increases the variability both in the overall developmental maturity of whole embryos, but also in the transcriptional maturity of cells within them. So on the left, I'm showing you that the distributions of embryo maturity, as measured by the pseudostaging method, get wider at higher temperatures. In the middle, I'm showing you that the pairwise correlations of transcriptional maturity uh, between cell types are, you know, there's a lot of correlation structure at reference temperature, and that structure is degraded at higher temperatures. The right plot is just showing kind of a summary view of the matrices in the middle. So taken together, what that means, to us at least, is that temperature stress not only accelerates development, it also desynchronizes development. Okay, so why? Why is that? Why do cells, some cell types race ahead while others are kind of left behind when you raise the embryo in warm water? And we hypothesized that, uh, that differences in, in you know, like baseline or what we call physiological levels of uh, some major cellular processes like you know, cell cycle or protein synthesis, certain aspects of cell metabolism might be associated with difference, it might explain differences in the relative developmental rate increases among cell types. And, and to make a long analysis short, it appeared to us that the cell types that accelerated at high temperature tended to be those that even at reference temperature expressed genes associated with the unfolded protein response. And the notochord was the most extreme example of that. So we decided to sort of dig into the notochord a bit more. The notochord, as many of you may know, is a, uh, a transient but very important tissue in the embryo. And one of its functions is to serve as a, a rigid support along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. So uh, Derek Stemple describes it as like a, I love this analogy, like a fire hose that's filled with water balloons. And the outer layer of cells are, are these sheath cells that secrete a tough layer of extracellular matrix and that kind of acts as the hose. And then the inside of the thing is filled up with these uh, fully these vacuolated cells that themselves fill up with fluid and provide hydrostatic pressure inside the hose, which makes the whole thing go rigid. So think of a fire hose full of water that's being used to put out a fire. Um, so to better understand how the unfolded protein response and, and maybe protein turnover could be related to notochord development, we made a, a, a cell trajectory. These are cells now uh, out of the notochord cells from the embryos in this experiment. Um, and we see a branch gene expression trajectory that begins at 18 hours post-fertilization and then branches off into the epithelial cells and the sheet, uh, sorry, and the vacuolated cells, uh, the, the sheath cells and the vacuolated cells. And, uh, and then there's some, you know, kind of maturation along each of those trajectories. And we, we then borrowed a technique from spatial statistics to test whether cells from temperature-stressed embryos congregated in particular regions of this UMAP. 
Uh, this identified a couple of sort of hot spots of notochord cells from stressed fish, which were particularly enriched in a region where the unfolded um, uh, protein response uh, appear to be elevated, which is, you know, um, sort of this region that consists mostly of mature sheath cells, not, not so much the vacuolated cells. So, okay, remember that the primary, I just told you that the primary function of these sheath cells is to produce, process, and package large amounts of collagen and other ECM proteins that's ultimately going to get secreted into the surrounding sheath and that thing is going to provide the structural support to the tissue and to the embryo overall. So we reasoned that maybe the unfolded protein response is important in notochord, even at 28 degrees, because it helps the sheath cells manage all the ER stress that's incurred by synthesizing so much protein. Um, and we hypothesized that if we knocked out components of the, of the UPR, all of that ER stress would get worse and we would get more severe phenotypes particularly in the face of temperature stress. And indeed, when we looked at crispins that lack ATF6, when we knocked out ATF6 in the fish, which is a key transcription factor that activates UPR in response to ER stress, we saw kinks and deformations, not just, not just bends, but like really bad problems in the sheath in temperature stress fish. And we even started to see defects like bends at reference temperature. So indeed, the phenotypes all got much worse. And to really zoom in on this, we uh, examined the ultrastructure of both the notochord sheath cells and the sheath itself using transmission and electron microscopy. And you can hopefully see that the ER, that you know, kind of um, layered thing, uh, shows signs of stress at higher temperatures, particularly in the crispins where it just gets like super disordered. And the most striking thing to us is that in the ATF6 mutants at high temperature was an accumulation of misfolded collagen fibers in the sheath cells themselves. You can see these hopefully marked in red, red arrows here. Those wispy filamentous aggregates, are, those protein aggregates, aggregates are not supposed to be there. We think that what happened is that that's collagen that didn't fold right and didn't get exported right into the sheath. And so it's just accumulating in the cells. And then likewise, the sheath itself is messed up. It doesn't have the collagen it needs to have and it's not ordered properly. And the collagen fibers themselves are not right. And so um, we think that all of this leads to a kind of a cascading structural failure of the notochord and irreversible anatomic defects in the embryo. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, um, I told you about um, whole embryo single cell RNA-seq uh, using Skyplex uh, to explain variability in cell type proportions and maturity across many, many individual embryos. I've told you that we've used that technique to um, look at how temperature accelerates development of some cell types and, and found that uh, some cell types accelerate more than others and that that injects asynchrony and variability overall into, the, uh, into embryonic development. And uh, I zoomed in on this one cell type, the notochord, which uh, requires UPR to manage ER stress even at reference temperature. And that makes them kind of the first point of failure, we think, uh, in the face of temperature stress and, and I think defects in uh, in or, or problems that arise in the notochord end up explaining the anatomic phenotypes, or at least some of them that we see in temperature stress fish. Okay, so now uh, in the second part of the talk, I want to tell you about how we're trying to use this to map out gene circuits to figure out which what are the key genes, and how are they regulating one another uh, to ensure reproducible development. So um, in order to, you know, we, we really wanted to kind of leverage the statistical power that we get from sequencing so many individuals. You know, this is sort of, you know, we can do experiments where N is like a thousand, so it's pretty good. Um, we want to define the genes required by different cell types in the embryo. And to do that, we're taking advantage of some recent improvements and advances in from the zebrafish community, uh, by others, not us, um, uh, to use CRISPR-Cas9 mutagenesis to make F0 injected embryos that strongly resemble conventional null mutants. And the reason that you'd want to do this, you know, what you do is you make guide RNAs against your favorite uh, genes, and then you inject those guide RNAs and Cas9 into uh, one cell stage embryos, the genes get knocked out, and then you end up with fish that look just like, um, you know, the, the sort of classical mutant uh, for, for the gene you've targeted. The advantage of doing it this way as opposed to using conventional uh, genetic tools is that it's super fast, and you can easily look at multiple, you can make multiple uh, gene knockouts, uh, at, you know, relatively uh, easily. So, We've been using this, uh, this technique to study uh, 
a bunch of genes. And so we knocked out, we made crispants for the genes that you can see here. Um, these are pretty much all uh, uh, transcription factors that are, for the most part, very conserved across vertebrates. And they're important in the mesoderm or the, nerval, uh, the, the nervous system, or in a few cases, the neural crest. And so we, we're, we're looking, we're doing single cell RNA-seq on crispants lacking these genes. And because the, the phenotypes for these genes manifest at different times, um, and also just to make interpreting the phenotypes easier, we're looking at multiple time points for each crispant, and, um, and we're looking at, at a kind of a range of time points for each crispant. Oh, sorry, uh, looking at multiple time points for each crispant, and we're choosing those time points based on kind of when the phenotypes manifest and so on. Okay, so we sequenced, this is another experiment now, we sequenced about a million cells this time from 812 uh, different CRISPR embryos. And uh, those embryos were, heart, were, were uh, collected at one of five different time points. And each one had you know, one of two, 22 different genes uh, knocked out. And so again, projecting the data onto the kind of reference and then now coloring the cell types by whether they're more or less abundant in a, in a given CRISPR, uh, given mutant than uh, control, you can, you can kind of uh, read out the effects of, of the mutation with single cell RNA seq, and so here I'm showing you uh, the data for TBX16, which is a, a generates a classic phenotype called spade tail, um, which is characterized by an accumulation of mesodermal progenitor cells in the tail and defects in skeletal muscle development. And I've, I told you how the points are colored. The points are colored by relative abundance of each cell type in the crispin relative to wild type, with blue being depleted and red being increased. And this UMAP shows the expected loss of muscle and accumulation of mesodermal progenitors. Now, those progenitors originate from the neuromesodermal progenitors, which also generate neural fates, including the spinal cord, the posterior spinal cord. And while the accumulation of mesodermal progenitors in TBX16 and TBX16 mesogenin 1 mutants has been super well documented and studied, what happens to the neural derivatives of the NMPs hasn't been characterized. And we see that surprisingly, uh, these crispants also accumulate uh, posterior spinal cord progenitors, which suggests that TBX16, mesogenin 1, and TBX16 like all contribute to producing the posterior spinal cord. And that's a new finding, a new observation. And this example just highlights how using single cell RNA seq uh, to look at mutants, look at the whole embryo, can reveal previously unappreciated genetic requirements in cell types throughout the embryo. Basically, when you can look at every cell type, you often find surprises. But what I'm showing you here is really, you know, just the, the tip of the iceberg in this data set. So in order to summarize the rest of the perturbations, I'm going to show you each genotype as a row in a heat map where the columns report the abundance of a cell type relative to control, control injected uh, embryos. Here I'm showing uh, TBX16 and the TBX16 means gen and double crispin at 36 hours. And what you can see is that, you know, the, the phenotype in terms of the cell abundances um, of these two crispins is very similar in terms of the cell types that are more or less abundant than controls from this time point. Um, but when we look at all the crispants for this time point, we can see that many cell types are altered. We see extensive phenocopying amongst crispants for uh, mesoderm lineage factors, for example, and likewise amongst crispants that are important in the central nervous system. And across the whole collection, 82 of 85 major cell types were significantly reduced in at least one crispin. So we think we've got a, a nice way to define the genetic requirements of uh, cell types throughout the embryo. But, you know, I, I started this talk about, you know, getting into talk about variability. So let's see if we can use and how we can use variability in cell proportions as a phenotype. How do these proportions impact variability across embryos? Let me show you some data from genes important in the neural crest. Uh, neural crest cells, uh, you probably know this, but uh, neural crest cells are a vertebrate specific cell type that's present transiently in the embryo, and they migrate out from the dorsal neural tube towards all different areas of the body and generate lots of important cell types later on, including uh, the ones that I'm showing you here. And in our experiment, we have fish that lack FOXD3 or TFAP2A or both. Um, and as you can see on the right, uh, the double mutant completely lacks pigment cells, and there are other problems as well. So uh, if I just present the data, you know, the, just the counts, uh, you can see that you know in, in these box plots, which show the number of pigment progenitors we collected from each embryo at this particular time point um, in the experiment, you can see that the TFAP2A single mutants and controls generate similar numbers of pigment progenitors, but embryos lacking FOXD3 make far fewer. Um, however, 
You can also see that even though the TFAP2A mutants make about as many pigment progenitors as the wild type on average, they appear more variable than the controls. And this effect is even more pronounced when we look at the melanocytes. There appears to be a dilation in variance. So how do we like test that and quantify that? Whether losing either of these genes or both of them increases the variance of the output of the neural crest. So um, to do that, we, we uh, borrowed techniques from bulk RNA-seq. Testing whether a perturbation alters variance in cell frequencies requires that we um, address a very common issue that comes up in, in many types of count data, which is that there's a relationship between the average number of the thing you're counting and the variance in that thing. And in this cartoon, um, every point is a different cell type. Um, and the horizontal axis shows the average number of cells, average number of cells of each type across individual embryos. And the y-axis is, is the coefficient of variation in that number, which of course is the standard deviation divided by the mean. So you can see this clear downward trend, and we can capture that trend um, the same way you know DEC does basically. We can fit a generalized linear regression of the mean against the coefficient of variation uh, with a, a response that's a gamma distribution. We can also uh, account for uncertainty in where each cell type lives in this plot by fitting a beta binomial distribution to each cell type's uh, 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 relative abundances across embryos. So that gives us little confidence intervals on each cell type on their CV. And now we can ask, you know, given this, we can ask whether a given cell type is significantly more variable than a typical cell type that's present at the same overall abundance. Uh, we can also ask whether knocking out a gene makes a cell type more variably abundant. Um, so Importantly here, we can, you know, because uh, knocking out a gene often changes the mean abundance of that, uh, you know, given cell type, we can account for how much the mean changes when we're testing for differences in variance. So now I've, I've shown you this is the same box plot as I showed you before, but now I've colored them by how much more variance there is in the mutants than our model expects based on the wild type controls. So this simple statistical method has phenotyped the TFAP2A mutant as having far more variable pigment cell output from the neural crest than the wild type. There are some important uh, experimental caveats here. Notably, you know, we're looking at F0 crispants, which will be mosaic, genetically mosaic to a certain extent. So to really confirm this, we would have to go and look at conventional nulls. But we think at least this is a promising way to sort of zero in on genes that might govern robustness in, uh, you know, in, in tissues uh, throughout the embryo. Okay, so hopefully uh, by now I've convinced you that this approach gives you like a super high resolution view of embryogenesis. Um, I want to now tell you about one of the one of several you know very unexpected things that um, that we've observed in these perturbation experiments. Um, we looked at at two genes that are like classic developmental genes in uh, in this first experiment, um, this first genetic experiment, NODO and TBXTA, which is also known as Brachyuri if you study uh, uh, other other models. And of course, you know. Uh, the notochord is like the defining feature of chordates, right? And uh, these two TFs that we're looking at have uh, overlapping phenotypes, and, and both of them are required for the notochord. And we didn't really expect to see anything super interesting with these because they've been studied for a long time. You know, brachyuri has been studied for more than 100 years. Um, we mostly included these particular mutants as controls to measure the sensitivity of the method because if they're required for the notochord, we shouldn't see any notochord. And uh, that, you know, that would tell us that we're that were, you know, uh, that, the, that the measurement is sound. And indeed, when we looked at, you know, um, when we looked at just compared the number of notochord cells and controls to those from noto mutants, we saw that as expected, basically no notochord cells were recovered from noto. Um, and while we saw the same thing for early developmental stages in the TBXTA CRISPR, we were pretty surprised because it looked like we were getting notochord cells back later. But that doesn't make any sense because you can look at the thing and there's no notochord. You, you know, there's no notochord. So what are these cells that our workflow is telling us are notochord cells? So we wanted to dig into this to figure out what was going on. Mostly we were just worried we were screwing up. Um, so uh, again, let's take a closer look at these cells from, uh, again, we're gonna look at the wild type, but uh, also um, the CRISPR uh, notochord cells. So this is the notochord, UMAP, and um, just like in the, the kind of the, the hot fish experiment, we see this branch trajectory that generates both vacuolated and sheath cells. And then we do the same thing where we ask, do the cells from the TBXTA crispants land in particular regions of this UMAP? And what you can see is that they mostly congregate with the sheath cells. Um, so, uh, you know, but again, like this doesn't make any sense because there's no sheath. 
So we wanted to know what these cells were. And in order to figure that out, we compared the red cells, the TBXTA CRISPR cells, to the gray cells, the regular control notochord cells, and looked for genes that distinguish them. And you know, we didn't find very many because they're in the same you, you know, spot in the UMAP. They have very similar transcriptomes. But there were a couple of genes. One of them was this gene called EPIC, which is um, a component of the extracellular matrix. And we were able to make um, a probe for whole mount in situ hybridization to visualize where this gene was expressed in the embryo. And <clears throat> in control embryos at 36 hours post-fertilization, we see that EPIC is, is expressed weakly in the notochord and more strongly in the head and the pericordal cartilage, which is a, a kind of a rod-like cartilage that runs ventrally and bilaterally to the notochord and will eventually become bone in the cranial skeleton. The notochord will become other stuff. In TBXTA, the notochord cells are missing, but you still have these epic positive early pericordal cartilage uh, cells. And uh, whereas in notochrispins, you don't get either one, right? There's no, uh, there's no pericordal cartilage and there's no notochord. Okay, so we think what happened here is that this region that we thought was just sheath cells of the UMAP, of the notochord UMAP, actually contains a mix of sheath cells and pericordal cartilage cells. And we didn't know to expect that because this is the first study to ever measure the transcriptomes of the pericordal cartilage. So um, that was you know, something we didn't know to look out for. Um, but what is striking is that these two cell types have nearly indistinguishable transcriptome cells, despite the fact that they are in different places in the embryo, they have different morphologies, they become different structures, and we reason that they therefore must also have distinct genetic requirements. And to dig into that, uh, we, we looked at some additional genes. And it's been shown by others, uh, particularly in mice, that FOXA2 uh, is required for notochord development. So we looked at, uh, we looked at a uh, FOXA2, FOXA3 double CRISPR, uh, which showed that um, you don't get notochord or uh, pericord cartilage in the absence of those two genes. So, what that you know allowed us to conclude is that both uh, notochord and pericordal cartilage derive from the same early axial mesoderm progenitor pool, and both structures require noto. The notochord requires TBXTA, whereas pericordal cartilage doesn't. These cell types have nearly identical transcriptomes. RNA really can't distinguish them very easily, but the genome uses different genes to make them. And that's exciting to us because the transcriptional similarity between notochord and pericordal cartilage and the overlap uh, in genetic circuitry needed to make them can actually gives us, gives us some clues into the evolution of the vertebrate head. There's still gaps in our understanding, the field's understanding of where cartilage and bone came from in the head as animals started to develop heads. The thing you have to realize is that notochords are way older than heads. Cephalochordates are jawless fishes. They have a clear notochord, but no cranial cartilage. And we hypothesize that what happened in the course of evolution is that the genetic program of notochord cells was adopted by the earliest head cartilage cells. And it's going to take a bit of work to explore that hypothesis, but Lauren Saunders, who, who co-led this study, is now working uh, off in her own group working on that independently. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, I've told you how we're using Skyplex in a different way to quantify how uh, uh, losing regulatory genes alters uh, lineage output and can make it even more variable. I've told you that uh, lineage transcription factor crispins often phenocopy one another in gains and losses and which cell types are affected. And I've given you this example of a cool finding that was a bit of a surprise, which is that notochord and pericordal cartilage cells have distinct genetic requirements despite having very similar transcriptomes. All right. I want to conclude by just a little bit of uh, looking looking forward, give me give you a couple of takeaways for what this means for us and and, and maybe for others in the field. Um, first of all, there's lots of applications for this overall workflow beyond you know development and uh, embryos. Um, the methods that I've shown you can be used on organoids, for example. So Amy Tressenreiter, who's a postdoc in my lab, has been collaborating with Tom Ray to study and optimize his retinal organoid system. Um, Tom is interested in that system both as a, as a means of understanding retinal biology, but also ultimately as a way of generating transplantable retina. Um, and so we've sequenced hundreds of individual organoids and have identified using the kinds of analyses you see here, ways to make the protocol produce organoids that are much more consistent 
in terms of the mix of cell types that you know Tom is interested in. So that's kind of a very practical thing. Um, more broadly, I've told you how we've been doing you know single cell RNA seq on many whole embryos at a time. This allows us to do experiments that reveal the effects of a genetic perturbation on the expression of every gene in every cell type in the embryo. And that enables you to study variability in their proportions and maturity. And this means what we can, be, you know, we can begin to do what I've been calling statistical developmental genetics, which is the use of tools from statistics to make causal inferences about the genetic control of development. And the statistical power we get from Skyplex and these types of experiments helps us zoom in on the genes and cell types that are the most significantly impacted by genetic or environmental perturbations. We think that those types of experiments are going to reveal cryptic phenotypes, accelerate downstream experiments, exploring their mechanisms, and ultimately help us connect molecular and cellular phenotypes to anatomic phenotypes. Uh, moving forward, you know, we have lots of experiments we'd like to do with this. We definitely want to scale this up like by an order of magnitude or more, uh, because if we, we think if we did that, um, we, we'd be able to map circuits that control uh, cell fate decisions in various lineages in a systematic way. And our dream would be able to sort of map such circuits with one big experiment rather than a series of many smaller experiments over months or even years, um, trying to alleviate that labor burden in developmental genetics. We're also uh, planning to compare genetic perturbations to chemical or environmental perturbations to see how they interact with or phenocopy each other. For example, we're currently working on interrupting major signaling pathways like TGF beta and Sonic Hedgehog and Wnt and, and so on using small molecules um, and really use that to dissect uh, non, you know, interactions between cell types. And finally, and I think of particular interest to this audience, there's some huge computational and statistical and analytical challenges to be solved. For example, you know, if we scrutinize patterns of phenocopying across genetic or environmental perturbations, we should be able to infer genetic networks. We're also hoping to use advanced machine learning tools to predict what would happen if we knock out a gene we haven't tested yet, or what might happen in a human based on zebrafish or mouse data. So there's clearly you know, a lot of work to be done, both in terms of methods development and in key applications of those methods. But my sense is that this work is going to yield a great deal of new biology. So I want to uh, thank, um, uh, in addition to funders, who I'll get to in a minute, um, particularly Lauren Saunders, uh, who did all of the genetic uh, experiments, and Sanjay Srivatsan, who um, invented Skyplex and, and uh, contributed greatly to those experiments. Mike Doherty, who led the um, temperature uh, uh, fish analysis and experiments. Maddie Duran, who supported both sets of people with lots of software and analytic tools. Um, I've already mentioned that Skyplex uh, invent, uh, that Sanjay invented Skyplex. He did so together with Jose McFallon, uh, who's now running his own lab at, at Columbia. Um, Mike is off at Embel. A bunch of these people have moved on to do their own thing. Um, Brent Ewing, Hannah Pliner, and Jiaji Chu all at various times have worked on or still work on the software that powers all of this analysis. Um, and I mentioned that Jay and I have been working together on the, on the technology, on the single cell technology for years now. That's been a, a tremendous collaboration. But I also want to thank um, Dave Rabel, Cecilia Moens, and particularly David Kimmelman, who are our kind of fish collaborators and basically helped turn my lab into a fish lab. Um, I want to thank the rest of the lab, and I want to thank the, the Paul Allen Frontiers Group, the NIH, uh, and the Brotman Beatty Institute for their uh, support. Um, and if I can, if I can, uh, I hope you'll forgive me for a shameless plug. Um, a number of people, as I just mentioned, have have rec very recently moved on to start their own labs or do their next thing. So we do have a, a, a one or two openings for postdocs. Um, we're really looking for people who are um, who are have strong developmental biology backgrounds and who are excited to learn how to use single cell genomics at scale to understand how the vertebrate genome encodes the program of embryogenesis. So if you think that's you, um, Seattle is an amazing place to do science. I'd love to talk to you about the opportunities. Please just shoot me an email and, and we can uh, we can discuss the possibilities there. So thanks very much. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Cole, for this amazing uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, I think we can start uh, with the questions. Uh, I have a question. So, we use two first person of our gene, these cells have disappeared. Is it because those cells did die or they disappear or they change to a different thing? 
Anna, could you repeat that? Just because I'm having a little bit of a trouble hearing yeah. questions called out from the so audience. The question is uh, when you do a knockout of a gene that affects the cell type, what's happening? Whether the cell type changes or it disappears completely? Is that your question? Or it goes to a different phase. Or, yeah, it goes into a different phase. Yes. So I think, I think that this is basically like a, a question of paramount importance, and we're still looking at it. Um, I think that the short version is that all of those things happen, and we do see examples where we think all of those things are happening. Um, we don't know what the kind of most prevalent motif is, you know, um, whether, you know, what the sort of typical scenario is. And I will say that um, RNA-seq is not great for uh, counting cells that are undergoing some kind of programmed apoptosis, because by the time you can see, you know, the transcriptional changes that occur, occur right before the cell is essentially lysed and compromised and, and is too poor quality to be captured by the assay. So it's a little hard to know when, you know, it's a little hard to, to detect that. Um, we don't see very often what appear to be wholesale new cell types. I would say the most common thing so far, and this is sort of anecdotal, is that cells get stuck. So they 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 reach a certain point in their in their development, like they reach a certain progenitor stage, and then they just don't commit to any fate. We we see sort of less often it seems like cells are getting redirected to a to an alternative fate. But I think you know your question is is critical to answer because um, you know you you want to extract some sort of general principles here, and I think to do that we're going to have to look at more genes, which is one of the things we'd like to do. It's a great question. Yeah, so um, we have another talk from uh, um, from the uh, online attendance. Uh, so I cannot see the name. Yan Yu is curious about the observation that mutant cells suffer more variation than wild type cells. So could you briefly comment on the reason of that? Yeah, so there's this there's this amazing paper which has been kind of a, a north star paper for us from. Arjun Raj and Alexander Van Utenarden that describe one way that this can happen. And in that paper, which I think is in Nature in 2010, they use single molecule fish to look at um, to look at the, the development of the intestinal cells in the worm. Um, uh, you know, and, and the worm, of course, like exactly every animal is exactly the same number of intestinal cells, right? And so in this particular mutant that they looked at. What's interesting is that some of the some of the mutant animals have the exact right number of cells, and some mutant animals have no cells. So it's like a bimodal phenotype and incompletely penetrant. And what they worked out was that the gene that they were studying, what it basically does is it establishes a, a positive feed-forward loop in the kind of circuit that makes intestine cells. And if you don't have that gene, um, the the gene circuit just doesn't reinforce its own expression enough to reach a critical threshold to guarantee that the cells get made. And you know, like just by random chance, sometimes the level that that circuit kind of is active is low enough that you get no cells. So so that's one way that um, a, a gene knockout can lead to increased variability. Um, but I, there could be other ways as well. And I think that, you know, digging, you know, the first step would be to sort of find genes, which find genes and associate, you know, find the cell types that they govern the variability of. And then the next thing would be to really dig in and, and look at the mechanism, like like Arjun and, and um, the Van Udenarten lab did in that, in that paper. Right. Um, so there is another question from Chris uh, talking about the new cell type as an interesting concept and do perturbed systems generate cells that become unrecognizable? Become unrecognizable? Was that yes, right? That because they are perturbed, you don't, you cannot assign a cell type. Yeah, I, I would say the answer is, is to be determined. We, we see, we don't know is like, you know, you look at your UMAP and then there's like a whole new alien cluster out in space, right? We don't see that very often, um, which I think basically means that like we don't see genes just turning on completely crazy non-developmental gene expression programs. What we do see are cells that 
you know, should be going to activate a certain gene expression program and probably only activate part of it. And so then that makes it look like they're kind of a different cell type, but they're actually just a sort of a messed up version of the, of the normal cell type. But exactly characterizing what that really means and which specific gene expression programs are either failing to come on or coming on when they're not supposed to, it's, it's much more laborious. We have one example in the developing zebrafish uh, kidney in the pronephros where we think maybe that's happening, but, um, but we're still sort of deciding whether or not we think it's kind of a, a real and interesting thing or whether we think it's just sort of like a, you know, real and uninteresting thing. <laughs> so, we'll see. I, I definitely would like to find and characterize such a cell type. I, I have a last question, if I may. Um, so I think that it's, I mean, during development, it's very nice to see how these uh, different cells uh, are committing to a, a particular uh, a cell fate and these changes. But this is also very much about um, cell to cell communication. And this is something that you don't really see, you know, on this data. So I was wondering whether you are uh, thinking of how to address that either experimentally or computationally to really uh, also uh, trace the communication between cells? Yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good point. And I mean, just in general, you know, cell to cell communication can be a hard thing to look at with, with um, genetics, because, you know, if you, if you, um, you know, like if there's redundancy in the network, or if there's, if, if receptors can receive multiple, can receive signals from multiple molecules, mm -hmm. it's hard to completely get rid of the signaling and various other things. So that's one of the reasons that we're excited about these small molecule uh, perturbations because you can you can more comprehensively turn off signaling pathways um, and then see how every single cell type is is impacted by the loss of signaling so that doesn't directly tell you which cell type is uh, you know which other cell type a cell is is getting signals from but it does tell you when and where signals from the environment the extrinsic environment are important and that can tell you you know kind of a next thing i think there's also probably a lot to be said for um, using genetics in the context of spatial transcriptomic readouts, but we're not there. We're not there yet with zebrafish. Uh, we're not doing that yet. Um, we would like to do things like that, but that's down the road for us. <laughs>